Well, welcome everybody to Living Hope Online. It's Sunday the 21st of August. How are you doing today? I'm joined by three guests from South Africa today. Hi guys. Hello. Chris, how are you doing? Chris. Good. We'll introduce them properly in a moment. But I was thinking about the fact that we are in holiday season. You know, it's August, it's holiday season. And some people are away and some people are off work. But you know what? I was reflecting on Psalm 121. I was reading it. What a great psalm. And the verse, first four verses of that psalm say, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither sl slumber nor sleep. And uh, here's a thought for you. You know, God never goes on holiday. So whatever your situation is today, you can be rest assured that our God, our Lord does not sleep. He does not slumber. He is watching over you 24 seven. And that includes holiday season. So what a comfort to be able to um, remember and think that today our God is tuned in. He is focused on us and we are focused on him. So I'm expecting him to do great things today and what a great service we have lined up. We have Rousseau coming to preach later. He's gonna talk about a culture of how we love one another and how we truly love one another. I know that's gonna be great. And we're gonna interview the guys in a moment, which I'm looking forward to as well. And then I wanna share just a little bit of important news about the online service and what's gonna be happening. But why don't we share the service today? Who, who could benefit? And the fact that we've got this great service lined up, who could benefit from tuning in today? Maybe just drop them a message, an encouragement, a thought, and a link to today's service and encourage them to tune in because we believe God's gonna do something today. So I'm going to invite the guys to pray. Perhaps, Ben, you can pray for yeah, us, sure. and then we're going to worship together. Yeah. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this beautiful day that you've given us. We yeah. thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have breath in our lungs, and we can praise you today. Yeah, Lord, uh, yeah, we just want to give you everything that we are right now. We want to bring ourselves before you and lay ourselves at your feet, Lord yes, Jesus. And yes, I just pray that you be given all the glory today, yeah, Lord Jesus. Yes, yes, I pray yes. that we glorify your name. And I pray that it doesn't come from a place of how we're feeling at the moment or the things that we've gone through today. But I pray it will be a deep, deep praise towards you. Yeah, yes, that yes. it's not dependent on our circumstances or how we feel, Lord Jesus. But it's mm. all for you because we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you and we want to give you all the glory. Amen. Amen. And we're going to worship now. We're going to worship to uh, a new song that we haven't shown before, led by uh, someone called Sean Browterseth, who'll be very familiar to these mm -hmm. guys. Sean is an elder in Oxygen Life in South Africa. And this song's called All Glory. So why don't we get to our feet, lift our hands, engage in the worship, and as Ben was praying, give the Lord all glory. Yeah. We enter your gates with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, we enter your gates. We pour out your praise in your presence, and in your presence, we pour out your praise. We enter, we enter your gates with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. We enter your gates. We pour out your praise in your presence. And in your presence, we pour out your praise. The song we sing, we sing forevermore.
So Jesus said something significant. Jesus said something significant in John chapter 13 and verse 34 to 35. This must have struck the disciples as something so new and fresh and and dramatic because they'd grown up around commandments. They knew what the commandments were. They were rooted in Israel and uh, so many people had learned them off by heart. But Jesus said this, he said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And, and that's what we want to focus in on today. You know, Jesus gave them a new command and that new command echoes through to us. And that command is to love and to love the way that he has loved. I mean, that's quite a powerful thought, isn't it? To love the way that Jesus loved. What a thought. And I know Rousseau's going to share more on that later. But we're going to chat to the the guys now and understand a little bit of what it is to love one another. So why don't you guys introduce yourself? So Ben and Tom and Seth. But why don't you say where you're from and uh, share with the guys what you're doing here? So my name is Ben. Um, I studied engineering for six years in Port Elizabeth. I come from Oxygen Life Church and uh, really had a good time there um, over the past uh, couple of years being there. Um, was involved with a lot of um, uh, outreach into, into a hostile community. I uh, haven't done too much youth ministry in terms of in the church, so I've had a, a good wake-up call. Well, you've been stretched here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's been good, but God's been gracious and He's shown me 
um, where to go and how to do things. But yeah, so I've been studying for six years, um, and this year I've just taken the year off to, yeah. to serve God in churches in 412. Okay, well, we'll come back to that and, yeah. and talk. So my name's Tom. Uh, I'm a from Auction Life Church. Uh, I'm 19, so this is my second year out of school. Uh, last year I took a gap year, um, and I uh, ministered with Altitude. So it's very similar to um, Year of Your Life, but a bit more ministry into the local community, a bit more outreach into schools. Um, and less focused on youth, but as well, very focused on youth. Every Friday we're at youth, throughout the week meeting out with youth as well. Um, but yeah, that, that was my that was my gap year last year. And I, yeah, the, throughout the whole of last year, ministered. And um, and then this year, I was wanting to actually go into studying, but I wasn't quite sure what God wanted me to do. Um, and so I started praying and um, actually felt, well, me and Ben started chatting towards the end of last year about possibly traveling and visiting four twelve churches. Mm. Um, and so that was that's what we we felt, and so then we started emailing and um, chatting, chatting to the photo of ad, uh, admin guys, yeah. um, and they organised a whole bunch of this. So now we wow. in that, in so, the, so just quickly then, which four twelve churches have you been to so far? So I've, I so I started off in uh, in Holland so with the Dutch guys there, and then yeah. Ben, you went into Southern Africa. Yeah, I was in Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe. Um, um, yeah, just before came out to Firebrand in Dublin. Yeah. We were there for three months. Yeah. And you've been here on the island since? 3rd of July. 3rd yeah. of July, yeah, yeah, so over a month now. And and Seth, why don't you, because your story is a little bit different, isn't it? Yeah, well, so hey guys, my name's Seth. I finished high school last year, end of last year. We've Our school year is from January to December, so started in January 15th on going around South Africa, so I started in Johannesburg and went to different churches there, um, mostly for 12. Spent time with leaders, wanted to see, the whole year has been to see different leadership styles and different giftings and different anointings that guys have carried into the life of the church. Yeah. Um, since I've been in Oxygen Life since I was born. Um, yeah, and so I went to Johannesburg and then Ben and I went on the Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe trip. Good time. Uh, good time. <laughs> it was really, a, it was amazing. Um, and then wow. we, I went back home for a few weeks and went to Cape Town um, for seven weeks. And then from Cape Town, went back home, Port Elizabeth for three or four weeks and then came to Isle of Man just before the 412 yeah. conference. Well, brilliant. I mean, it, it's great to see young guys given their time to input to the churches and and I know from chatting to some of the churches not just our church how you guys have just served your hearts out and and that's you know that's a blessing and we we in our community group this week we were studying how Jesus said you know if you want to be great you must first of all be a slave to all yeah. and and so serving is the best way yeah. isn't it to 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 plug in so you've seen a lot hopefully you've been shaped and, and learning a lot but one of the things we wanted to talk about is how you have found this whole area of the church is how do they love one another you know you you don't know this but um we had a uh, someone important to us spent some time in oxygen life and i caught up with her recently and she said of oxygen life i'll never forget it she said those guys know how to love people and, and that's a great testimony for, for a church. So what, why don't you just share a little bit about what, what have you found and what do you see about the signs of the church loving one another in the way that Jesus commanded here? What are the sort of things that you might pick up on? So I'd say that um, it's interesting that you're asking these questions because God's really been working in my heart this year about love. Mm. And um, he did a deep work in me in 2020 about love during the lockdown period. But uh, I feel like it's coming back again. And I feel like God's been been reshaping my mind and, and reshaping the way that I think about love. Mm. And um, I think even back then, I'd, I'd realized that actually um, we need to first understand our position, how God has loved us. Mm. And when we understand our position of how God has loved us, mm. it's so much easier for us to love one another. Yeah. And we think of the sinful state that we are in and that there's actually nothing that we can do to get ourselves out of it. And the only way is, was Jesus dying on the cross. And it's like, that is the, one of the biggest things possible. I mean, if, even if my friend had done something, I mean, even if I take the blow for one of my friends, kind of inside, you know, I'm like, ah, why did I have to do that? You know, why did I have to take a blow for my friend? I didn't do anything wrong. Yet Jesus came and he died for the sins of the world when he was sinless. Mm, yeah. For every single generation he died for. And I kind of think about that. And I think about, um, funny enough, you speak about John uh, 13 and, and, John 13 and John 15, they kind of went hand in hand for me. And even recently, just reading through them again, and Jesus 
said um, to the disciples, he said, um, as you said, um, you must love one another just as I have loved you. And he says, no greater love than this for uh, for, for one to lay down their life for a brother. Yeah. I'm just paraphrasing there. But just thinking about that, I was going, Lord, if you want me to love other people, how do I do it? If you are the perfect example of love, what yeah. does it look like? Yeah. And it was Jesus laying his life down. Yeah. And so that's the, one of the things that has really been working deep in my heart this year is that if I want to love people perfectly, it's not just putting on a smile or just hugging people or um, making them food. And it is those things, but actually laying my life down for my brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah that's powerful. And and um, perhaps, you know, one of the first signs you look for in a in a church context where people are loving one another the way Jesus commanded is this, there a love for Jesus. Mm. You know, yeah. if, if, if there's a love for Jesus around then the likelihood is love for one another is yeah. going to be the overflow of that. And, and what about you, Tom? It's actually funny you're saying that because I remember when when we arrived in Ireland and we were, we were ministering, but the first week we arrived there, Mervis arrived as one. He was there for a week. And I was chatting to him a, a very like a very similar conversation about love and how do we love. And, and he kind of looked at me and he said, it's like, it's simple. It's not hard. Love Jesus. Mm. And he said the best way to love his bride is to love him. And so that's that's also been a journey I was take like I was and still being taken on. It's like if I can love Jesus, then everything everything else. If I can see Jesus, if I can understand what Jesus, the way He laid His life down for me, then it becomes a joy to lay my life down mm. for my brothers. It's, it becomes it becomes easy to to exalt them because Jesus wanted to exalt the Father, and He wanted to exalt the Holy Spirit, and He laid His life down, yeah. and it becomes very very easy to exalt brothers when you see how Jesus laid down his life yeah yeah and so that was i think that was the probably the biggest thing i learned about love was like i don't have to you don't have to fake it mm. yeah, when, you, when you see and you understand the love that jesus poured out for you mm. it's like how can you not love others how can you not give that love out to others you know mm. yeah that, that's that's good insight and and seth you got anything you want to add into that uh it'll be a, on a bit of a different tangent to them oh, yeah. um but i have seen like hosting has been really, really yeah. amazing yeah. to see people's love. For me, there's been many, many times where I have met the person. I said, hi, my name is Seth. They said, my name is so-and-so. And then I've gone and stayed with them for a week or longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they've hosted me so, so well. That has been really something beautiful to see. Even, yeah, just in the in the greater body of Jesus. Um, yeah. That's been really amazing. And then also the openness and the... Willingness to be corrected and the actually the desire almost to be corrected. Yeah, I was staying with a guy who was an is an elder in one of the, the Gauteng churches, and I was staying at his house. And after the after my time there, I was gonna leave and I was gonna actually go on the Africa trip. And he sat, he like called me over and we sat. I sat down next to him and he said, "Hey, bro, I just wanted to say that I've realized that I've been." He was he was saying like. It wasn't, it wasn't actually anything that was really openly, I didn't even notice it. And he was just saying, it was just words that were saying, that he was saying that were not always building up. It wasn't always encouraging. And um, he said, bro, I really just wanted to say that I'm sorry. And that uh, I recognized that and you actually showed me that without me even knowing. And he said, Do, is there anything else you see in my life? And I, I didn't, I actually hadn't seen anything else. Mm -hmm. And, but he was open yeah, and, yeah. and it opened the floor to actually allow Jesus' light and his love to come in yeah. to that area. And uh, I know that God will help him um, to, to, to conquer that because his yeah. heart is, is there for it. Yeah, that's so cool. And, and actually one of the things I want to just pick up on a little bit is, Examples, you know, you've given two examples there of how you hosted, and also, you know, our openness and accountability and relationship with one another, and and actually, when you're going across nations, that openness is quite unusual, isn't it? You know, you're actually talking about people you probably met in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not people that you've known forever. Yeah. Who are inviting you to speak into your, into your life? But what about you guys? What sort of examples have you seen across the churches that are in this space, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. I think one thing for me, which has been massive, especially being here, is it's a small thing, but it's lifts. Uh, we are like, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been, I've been, we've been, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, it really has been because I'll be in like Port St. Mary and I'll be down south and I need to get up to Douglas and I've got no way. But then Joel and one of the other interns be like, hey, I'm heading up here. Do you want to come with me or whatever? Yeah. Or he'll even offer to like help me organize buses and stuff, you know? It's almost going like taking 
taking initiative um when like i didn't even message him i was kind of still looking for a lift and he'd be like i think you are going are you are you, are you coming up to douglas like can i give you a lift and it's like like you'd almost take initiative he'd be like you'd put out his hand first and he'd be like can't do you want to come with me you know it wasn't me asking it was just it blessed me so much that he would like and it wasn't only him there's various guys across church i'm now in the west yeah. and there's so many so many times i mean even us getting here um somebody gave us a lift here we we had nowhere and even last night we stayed at somebody else's house because mm-hmm. we walked from port mm-hmm. Mary up to uh peel and in the morning we phoned somebody we'd be like hey can we stay at your house and they're like yeah of course like yeah. they repaired prepared a bedroom for us everything mm-hmm. and then it was like then we were like hey we have to get down to douglas now and it's like somebody's like oh no we can give you a lift you know and i think it's it's such a blessing like lifts is a small example but yeah it's like it's almost like an outstretched hand going like can i help you can i serve you, you know yes. and that's mm-hmm. that's been for me it's been a, a, a such a yeah blessing i know to that, part that's of. good and just as you're speaking i'm thinking of how jesus says you know anyone who gives you a cup of yeah. water in my name you know you're doing it for me basically yes, so yeah. that, then and that's perhaps a lesson for us in in sharing this is mm. that don't despise the small yeah. acts of love there's the big ones but the small ones they matter too yeah, yeah. and anything for you i right? think honestly if it wasn't for the provision um or god's provision through the saints for us this year yeah. i don't none of it would have been possible yeah uh, especially with my little south african currency <laughs> i wouldn't have made it very far yeah and um i think just the generosity people have shown so like there's a there's this acts of service in terms of like lifts hosting i mean there's been many times i've offered to to pay for certain things or even contribute towards food or something and people are just going like no yeah it's fine yeah take it and yeah. it's, it's it's really it's it's bringing out the culture of like what is mine is yours and what is yours is mine yeah and it's really what we need to be living out and and i, I want to be doing the same and i have been doing the same but it's just like we need to continue we can't lose the heart of doing that yeah. and when i go back home it's like it's i've been stirred even more to to be living in that culture of what is yeah. yours is mine yeah. and what is mine is yours and living with open hands pretty much um yeah it's like you, you hear many um stories it's like people they'll get a vehicle you know and they're going like lord it's it's yours i know it's not i know it's not mine i've got it with an open hand i'm not holding yeah. onto this thing tightly but it's it's actually yours mm. this petrol money that i've got it's actually yours it's not mine you know i want to use it for your kingdom and i really do believe god sees those things and and people don't often think that that god blesses um those acts of service but he yeah. actually does yeah, yeah and they're so important even though they might not be noticed all the time they are so so important yeah yeah that's brilliant and we'll ask you one last question in a minute but let's just try and summarize mm. some, some of what we've been talking about so if you think about some of the signs of this culture of loving one another the way jesus did we've talked about loving jesus as mm. probably our first priority if you don't love mm. jesus you're not going to love others like yeah. jesus yeah. did so that get we need to think about that then the small things of lifts and food tables that they, they matter welcoming people into our homes and into yes. our lives it's more than homes isn't it it's yeah. lives yeah, as well so it it's yeah. opening ourselves up yeah. to, to people coming in so those are some of the things we can activate and then as, as you were saying there ben we consider those things that are ours not just ours yeah. Yeah. actually what's mine is, is is yours so those are some great little tips on how we can love one another but i am going to challenge you guys now on this final question is yeah. how can we grow in love what from what you've seen and how you you've been involved and served what what are some of the ways that you think we can grow in how we love one another that's that's flawed you isn't it that question, that's a good yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think that you don't need a prophetic word to love people yeah uh that you don't need god to speak audibly to you to give someone a lift or you don't need god to speak audibly to you to to go and apologize or to ask someone to speak into your heart or to encourage someone that it's for free and that mm. god has called you already to do yeah. it mm-hmm. and that the calling is in the word um the prophetic word from god is in the word his audible voice is in the word man mm. that he has called us to love one another as he has loved us first mm. Mm. and i think for for myself because i've i've been been hosted by people and i'm like Oh man, I don't know if I can do this. Like these guys are hosting me so well. When yeah. I get back to Port Elizabeth, I'm going to the actually there is a sense of like responsibility from the Lord that I need to love people as these guys have they've shown me now. Mm-hmm. Like I'm no longer blinded to it. It's like I've seen it with my own eyes. Mm-hmm. And how like do I need God to say to me afresh, "Hey Seth, this is what you need to do." Mm-hmm. No. God has already told me in his word what to do. Yeah. And so it's to do it because 
we first love God yeah, yeah. and then to let that overflow and just go for it as much as you can because mm. that's what yeah. God has called us to do mm. yeah I think even on the back of that like this, I was speaking about the small things the lifts and stuff another small practical thing that I've noticed that where I've really felt love is an encouraging word like just like not even a prophetic word just going like I see this like Ben I see this in your life I see um, I see how you serve like it just it's like like almost encouraging and lifting up and building building up the bride of Christ by, by loving them and giving them encouraging one another the, the word of God speaks about it, encourage one another daily mm-hmm. um, and it's like it is that thing even yesterday we were, when we were on this hike out of the blue we were walking Seth just goes Tom you know I've seen this in your life and and he, and he shared something with me that it wasn't a prophetic word not something it's just something that he'd seen he said this has stirred me up and I've, I really I just want to like commend you on that mm. and I've, I kept walking and I was like this is so inc-. I felt so loved at that moment mm. and it took a minute of his time just to go hey bro I see this in your life this is like this is what I see and it's like it's amazing I, I really mm. want to commend you on that and I, I left there for the next half an hour almost floating because I felt so loved you know yeah. and it's something so small but it can really it can really change a person's day and it can really make them feel loved awesome. so yeah. yeah I think like one way we could grow in it is I've seen for myself over the past is that actually you know the things that you struggle with and you know the things that are difficult for you to do and that might be speaking to someone new that might be being on the welcome team and welcoming people in that might be going to that person who's sitting on the fringe and not doing anything and you you're like oh it's too awkward to go and speak to that person and i think for myself i've seen in the past is generally the way i grow in love is i look out not inwards towards myself but outwards and look at the things that actually feel like they're going to cost me a lot. Mm. And when I see those things, I'm going, Lord, I want to do that. Because I've I've heard many times now, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, I'd never do that. I'd never go here. I'd never say that. Or I, I would never be the person to go and just encourage guys like that. Mm. And I'm thinking in my mind, it's like Jesus has called us just mm. a sense that he's called us to encourage each other daily. It's like, I should be doing those things. If, if I'm looking inwards towards myself and going, where those areas where I actually struggle, I struggle to give time to people. I struggle to, to if it might be giving people lifts, I struggle doing those things. So I'd say one way to grow is look at the areas in your life where you struggle to show love and start acting on those because yeah. I have to do those. <laughs> that, that, that's a good, a, a good challenge to finish on, isn't mm. it? So, uh, well, thanks, guys. So, so much richness in, in what we've been talking about. But, I, I mean, <laughs> picking up on what you said, Tom, I want to commend you guys for how you have landed in Living Hope because um, I have heard nothing but good things about how you've served, the contribution you've made, loving on those perhaps who are on the fringes, you know, that, that you've just met. So keep doing that, mm-hmm. keep, keep doing more of that. And I think, you know, the more you reflect Christ in those ways, the more that you're gonna reach beyond yourselves. You know, so uh, it's there's a lot of truth, isn't there, in when Jesus says, "If you're faithful with little, He'll entrust you with 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 more." Mm-hmm. So that's what you're saying. You know, the little thing in front of you, grab that with your whole heart, yeah. and then the next thing might be a bit bigger. <laughs> and so keep going, guys. Bless you, and thank you so much. And and what we want to do now is we actually just want to minister and and maybe pray over some folks. Mm-hmm. And and if you have any prophetic words. Um, that, that you're sensing in terms of reaching to people then you can share them now so uh, and then we'll pray is that okay mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so um go for it let's just pray and if you have a word then share the word and and then pray mm. <clears throat> thank you Lord. Mm, I'm, I'm even just sensing now um to maybe even encourage guys that as we speak about love amongst brothers and sisters and amongst the the, fa- the church family and um but just as much as we need to love the the our brothers and sisters jesus as well says he says they'll know us by our love and so even even uh, maybe it's even a, a challenge that the lord might be setting up for us is to love those that are not in the body um to love the people that we meet daily just as 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 people that we might meet in the street or people that we meet in the shops or or wherever it is people that aren't in the body to love on them um, and so, yeah, maybe that, I don't know if that's a word for somebody or in particular, or if there's somebody that, that you, you might be thinking now in your head, there's somebody that I know is not in the church and I really want to get them into church, love on them, love on them, put, put great effort into loving them. Just as Jesus laid down his life for us, put great and, and a great amount of effort 
to love on them go the extra mile take the extra extra step i don't know what it looks like it might be taking a meal over to the house or, or whatever it is but take the extra step um to make them feel loved and through that maybe they'll open up their hearts to the gospel maybe they'll open their hearts up to jesus and, yes. and come to the knowledge of, of of our lord jesus christ so yeah i just even encourage you guys like yeah st- love our brothers and sisters in the church absolutely mm-hmm. but step out step out look for that think I, I i can think of people now even in my head i'm going i need to love them better even though they aren't in the church where how can i love on them better how can i make them a meal how where can i meet up with them to to encourage them and push them and just love on them um so yeah thank you lord, mm, yes, lord. and even for the the person that could be feeling like that uh as tom was sharing and maybe you've heard what we've said and i feel like i i can't and even what with what Ben said is I can't um step out and and do things that are really hard. Is they too hard for me? It's just too hard. And I want to encourage you with 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9. It says God who has called you into fellowship with mm. his son Jesus Christ our Lord is faithful. Yeah. Yes. And God is faithful to give you courage. He'll be yeah. faithful to help you to walk in his footsteps. He'll be faithful to help you to keep loving him and to step out and to keep growing in your love for him and in and your love for the church. Mm. And so I just want to encourage you that you can you can bring it before the Lord. You can bring your fears, you can bring your doubts and and God truly is faithful. Yeah. He truly will help you. He wants to yeah. see he wants to see you throw that off and and run for him with everything that you can. Um and and he will be faithful to you. Yeah. Thank you Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and just even getting practical about it, thinking about those things now. and you you probably have them on your mind at the moment those things that where you struggle to love people um those things that you, you can you can think of them you know those areas where you struggle to love people and just as they they rise up in your heart right now lord jesus i pray that you continue to identify these areas and yes, bring them up lord jesus so that we be looking more and more like you daily yes, yes. and that we don't leave one bit of us which is which is covered up lord jesus but i pray that in everything we do we will let our love be genuine yes. and that we will serve you and we will seek you with everything that we have lord and as us pray even along what what Seth is saying now lord it, and this remind of the scripture where it says we're given everything we need for life and godliness yes. lord you have given us everything that we need everything lord jesus and i just pray that as we see that and as as you have given us everything may we access that lord jesus yes, lord. so be able to love our brothers and sisters more and more and even those who aren't a part of the body just so that we can show your love and and they can they can come to faith and they can see that there's a, there's actually a real life waiting for them but they need to get hold of it and we just pray right now lord to help us with that may you may you actually just strip us of our selfishness may you strip our pride away yes, yes. and may you just bring us bare before the cross that yeah. we will to love genuinely as yes. you have loved yes. us yes. amen amen amen, amen. Yes. well thanks guys and blessings upon you for the remainder of your travels when do you leave the island Phew, that's a good question. <laughs> we we still feel it out. We still pray about it and and waiting for God. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys want to host us, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for coming in and we look forward to seeing what God's going to do in your lives going ahead. It's awesome. been great. Hey man, well right now we're going to um worship. We're going to worship to that song King of My Heart. We're going to go back to where we started our conversation to say, you know, first of all, if we're going to love, we've got to make Jesus king of our heart. So, let's worship and if you have any prayer requests that you would love us to pray over, then just drop them in the comments and the team will be picking those up and we'll be praying. But let's worship now. Let the King of My Heart
Well, that's so wonderful, isn't it? To listen to young men who are laying down their life for the gospel and so super encouraging. Well, now's the time in our service for family news. Yep, we want some family news. And the first thing that I, I want to just remind us of is something we've been hearing about, but there is an alpha launch on Friday, the 2nd of September, which is going to be at the Villa Marina in the Colonnade Suite. And we've got Pastor Peter Nembard, who is one of our partners in the gospel, leads the Ark Church, an amazing man of of God and he's going to be bringing his testimony from prison to pastor what a brilliant reason to invite someone to come and hear the good news of Jesus Christ to actually hear how the good news isn't just a theoretical thing but it's a life-changing transformation and Peter embodies that Pastor Peter Nembard, founder and full-time senior pastor of Ark, a radical church. I didn't start leadership when I got saved. I was leading when I was in the world. But I was leading people into crime and I was leading them into violence and I was leading them into gangs. But I think God saw something and I think he looked at me and he saw what I was doing in my badness and my bad days. And I was a bad guy before I came to God. Back in the day, we were smoking. So we're all in the room talking about angels and talking about aliens and talking about God and Jesus and there was about 15 of us in the room and I was the only one in the room that said I don't believe in no God. I think God heard that conversation. So you don't believe in me. Okay. Two weeks later God says okay you don't believe in me and I got arrested and they held me overnight but I never went home two and a half years in prison and during my time of being left alone God revealed himself to me in that prison the way that he powerfully revealed himself to me I could never turn around and say God does not exist he revealed himself to me powerfully be thinking about and praying about who can we invite who can you invite to come along to that and it will be a great evening so that's Friday the 2nd of September and then Secondly, I just want to mention the Deacon Equip. Um, we're in Tuesdays, three Tuesdays in September, Tuesday the 6th, 13th and 20th of September at St. Joseph's in Williston. Um, Jonathan and Ewan are going to be bringing some powerful teaching around what it means to be a deacon in the church. But it's not just for deacons. It's for anyone who senses maybe there's a call of leadership on my life. What does that actually mean? How, how am I going to work that out? Then why not sign up? Because it's not uh, a guarantee a promise of an office coming to that but what it will do is it will disciple us and help us to grow in this calling of leadership a much needed gift in the church in in these days so you can sign up for that through the usual places and um, come and be discipled we are about being discipled you know for equipping the saints for the works of of service so that's a great opportunity not to be missed in Proverbs 3 and verse 9 to 10, it says this, it says, Honour the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Well, you know, this concept of first fruits is an interesting one. In some cultures across the world, and, and I've met some people um, who have described this to me, when you get your first paycheck and you're, you're new to the employment world and you get that first paycheck through, no matter how much or little it is, then you're expected to take that check and give it straight to your parents parents. The first fruits of your labour go straight to your parents. Well, well, why is that? Well, it's an act of respect. It, it's a sacrificial thing that recognises the sacrifices that were made by parents in bringing their children up. And indeed, it's a thank you for all that um, has been input to their lives. But I also read that in probably 99% of the cases, that check is immediately returned by the parents to the child. So it's given as recognition, but then out of the kindness of the parents, they return that check. Well, why am I sharing that? Well, it's a biblical principle in some ways, this whole idea of who will I honour with my first, the first fruits of my labour? Who am I going to honour? And the reality is that anything less 
than returning the first fruits or offering the first fruits is just leftovers. You know, if, if in that culture you got your paycheck and you gave your parents a little bit later on in the week after you'd spent some of the money, then you're not giving them the first. You're not actually offering them what the um, return of that paycheck is all about, is about honour. What you're actually doing is saying, well, here's a little bit that just for you left over. And in our giving, God needs to be first. In, in fact, it's not just a case that God asks to be first. God, uh, God cannot receive anything less than first. We see in Israel how the firstborn lambs are sacrificed in order that the rest are redeemed. And that returning of the first of our first fruits is um, so that the rest of our increase is redeemed under the Lord's blessing, which is what this scripture is saying. So when it comes to our tithe, the Lord asks us to just give that first tenth to him, to honour him. It's a test of our hearts. Who are we going to honour with our first fruits? And then he promises he will redeem the rest. And there's so many testimonies, you know, I've heard over the years so many testimonies that God is always faithful when we live in this way, when we put him first in our finances. So maybe just a thought for us today to put first things first. Is the Lord first in our lives? When it comes to our giving, are we giving him of the first fruits? So why don't we do that? Make sure that we're giving of our first and our best back to the Lord. You can do that giving in by any of the regular ways and the details will be up on the screen. And as you do your giving, we're going to show a video now about Alpha, which I mentioned earlier, and we can pray into that as well. So thank you for all your giving and enjoy the Alpha video. Everyone wrestles with life's big questions. Questions about hope, purpose, meaning, and love. Imagine a safe place where you can connect with others in your community, where you can come and have conversations in a way that is authentic and unforced, where there's no pressure to talk. Everyone's welcome and anyone can ask tough questions and share honestly about what they believe that's what Alpha is all about. Alpha started in a church in London years ago with a simple idea to encourage people to explore the Christian faith. Lives were transformed and it began to grow all over the world. Today, you can find Alpha in schools, coffee shops, church buildings, prisons and homes. And so far, millions of people have experienced Alpha. So what is Alpha? Alpha is a series of interactive sessions exploring the basics of the Christian faith. In each session, you will be made to feel welcome, and some groups will even start with food. Then you will listen to a talk and have discussions in small groups. Spending time together over a cuppa or eating together creates space for you to connect with people, relax, and build friendships. The talks tackle core questions about life and faith from a Christian perspective and the discussion allows you to unpack these ideas without fear of being corrected or judged. All of this is done in a fun environment where anyone is welcome. The Alpha course is run over 8 to 11 weeks with a weekend day away where there are opportunities to experience worship through music and moments for prayer. Curious about faith? Try Alpha. Yeah, Father, I want to thank you for all that we have been entrusted with, everything that you have given us. And Lord, may we always have an attitude in our heart of first, of first things first, first fruits return to you. So help us with what we have given and what we will give to do it under your lordship, putting you first and honouring you in the way that allows the rest to be redeemed and come under your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, now I'm looking forward to a great word from Rousseau. Rousseau is a rich blessing to us in, in Living Hope, leading the churches down in the south of the island. And he's felt this word on his heart. And uh, I've asked him to come and share it because I know it's going to speak into us. It's going to challenge us. So open up your notebooks. The notes are available online. And let's tune into what Rousseau is going to bring us. Well, I'm very glad to be here with Chris today, and I've got a message that's titled, My Dear Children, that I want to share with you. You know, God knows you better than you can ever know yourself. He surrounds you and His Spirit dwells within you and with you if you belong to Jesus. Daily, He would cover you and protect you from all manner of injustice and evil and malice. Let me tell you, if the Lord were to lift his hand of protection fully from you, you uh, and you had to face the enemy in your own strength, your life would be like that of Job's or worse. We have much to thank God for every single day of our lives. Now, nothing is hidden from him. As you know, his eyes searches every part of you. No heart, yours or mine, is a mystery to God. All things is an open book to Him. He knows your mind. He knows what you desire. He knows what you value. He knows what you hunger for. He sees past the pretense. He sees beyond the veneer that you and I are so good at presenting to those around us. He sees your every path. He knows your every move. He knows that there are moments in your life and mine, when we are faithful, He knows about the seasons, perhaps when we are less so, in thoughts and actions and in our ambitions. And still He loves. Still He pursues. And somehow, even in all our shortcomings, He desires for intimacy and He desires for relationship with us. Knowing our darkest secrets, our greatest failures, our worst habits, and even our deepest shame, God still continues to extend that hand of friendship and fellowship and bringing us into His family. It really is extraordinary. Almighty God extends undeserved, selfless, self-sacrificial, and unconditional love because He is good. Not because you and I could earn or deserve this unmerited love. He shows us His attention and His affection. For some reason, God chooses to make mankind the object of His love, of His unmerited love. And He does so as a committed act of His will. Now, sadly, you and I and the church, we don't always carry the Father's heart like this when it comes to sharing life and walking together. If you've been a Christian for some time, chances are that you would have been disappointed or perhaps even hurt within the context of God's assembled people. Down in the south of the island where my wife and I are part of the leadership team, we have a monthly community meal and and recently in our monthly community meal, we, we had barbecues at the front of the church. And the idea is we just bring a lot of food, all the church members, and everybody gets to share. And we invite the community to come in and, and come and share in the feast with us. During the course of the evening, uh, we invited people in and, and, and some came in. And, and these two girls, perhaps 12, maybe 14, 15 year old, came walking past the front of the church and and one of our welcomers invited them heartily to come and share in the feast. One of the girls immediately turned in and said, Yes, that sounds amazing. I can do with some free food. But her friend became very serious, very stoic and said, No, I will not go into that place. I will not go into a church. Well, it's just free food. It's just fun. It's just laughter. Come enjoy some time with us. No came the stern answer. I won't go into a church. And what became very apparent to me as I watched this whole thing unfold is that somewhere, somehow, something had happened to this young person in the assembly of God's people. In the church, she had picked up hurt and she had picked up a bruise. 
Now that had me thinking about something that happened in my own life when I was about the same age, probably about 12 years old. I remember uh, being at some big event at church on one particular evening and uh, I was looking up to some of the 17, 18 year old um, young men in our youth group and, and, and having interaction with them. We were waiting for the service to start or whatever that event was. And something was said and, and, and there was a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation. And I remember one of the one of the senior boys grabbing me by the scruff of my neck and violently shaking me around while telling me in very colorful language exactly what he was going to do to me. I didn't want to go to church after that. To be honest, I didn't want to be part of that youth group anymore. Now that's more than 30 years ago, but I still remember it clear as day today. Let me tell you this story, something that I heard from a, a, a pastor friend of mine in Sao Paulo when I traveled there recently. I met a man who was a deacon in a very large church, a mega church. He was a dad of a disabled boy and um, in that part of Sao Paulo where he was living, medical attention wasn't just freely available. You had to either have serious medical aid or you needed to be able to pay before you could get help. Well, after an evening at church service, he was on his way as part of his responsibilities to go and bank the tithes and offerings. Sao Paulo is a 24-hour city that never goes to sleep. He was on his way to the bank when the phone call came through that there was serious trouble with his son. Well, he called one of his elders in the church and said, look, I'm in a bind here. May I take some of this tithe and offering money just to ensure that my son can get the treatment he desperately needs right now? I will repay you as soon as I am able. Well, came the reply down the phone from his elder. If you touch that money, I will make sure that you end up in jail. Dear God, how did we get there? How did we get to that place? It was absolutely devastating for this man and for his family. Now, I can give you example after example, sadly, of where Christian men and women failed one another almost always forgetting that we have been called and set aside to have a higher standard, to act like heaven and not like the world. But this is not a new thing. You know, people behaving badly in church has been an issue actually right from the beginning. One might be forgiven for thinking, well, perhaps over the centuries we've drifted so far away from what Christ had intended, intended at the beginning that, that these kind of problems present themselves today. But, but actually, a careful reading of Scripture shows that there were issues right from the very beginning. Let me show you. The Apostle writes to the Corinthian church and he reminds them of the following. He says in 1 Corinthians 12, There is one body, but it has many parts. But all its many parts make up one body. It is the same with Christ. We were all baptized by one Holy Spirit. And so we are formed into one body. It didn't matter whether we were Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free people. We were all given the same spirit to drink. So the body is not made up of just one part. It has many parts. Now, a couple of things in what Paul says here. He says it didn't matter whether we were Jews or Gentiles. Do you know, right at the beginning in the early church, racism was one of the primary problems they had to deal with. We read about it in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Now about this time, when the number of disciples was increasing, a complaint was made by the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. No way! Can you imagine that? When the church come together and food was being shared amongst those who needed it most, that they were holding or withholding food from certain, uh, certain people, certain widows, because they were not native speaking Hebrews. What about this? Paul speaks uh, about this, whether we were slaves or free people. 
This was a difficult dynamic in the early church in that part of the world. This dynamic of master and slave. In here, in the church, when God's people meet, we are brother and sister. But out there, you can be my master. You own me. You tell me exactly how I'm to live and what I am to do. And I, I can't choose for myself. We read about this when Paul appeals to a friend called Philemon, who owned a slave called Onesimus. Onesimus had ran away from Philemon and subsequently had become a Christian. Now, as Philemon's property under the law of that day and age, Onesimus should have been punished severely. But, says Paul to his friend, be kind, follow the way of heaven, not the way of Rome. I think that first church meeting together as master and slave came back together again, must have been super awkward in the natural. Both men would have had to choose to lead their hearts. So the early church had plenty of issues to work through. These are but two examples. But what Paul says to the Corinthians is that regardless of your social standing, regardless of your culture, regardless of your upbringing or how much money or lack thereof you may have, we are one body. Yes, there's all the ingredients for social friction and frustration and even relational explosions. But we must keep our heads and our hearts in Christ. After all, together, as diverse as we may be, we are the body of Christ. And if there was ever anyone who understood how difficult and frustrating church can be and the church family or the people within church could be, it would be the Apostle Paul. Even a quick glance and reading through his letters or some of the letters to the churches in the New Testament would show issue after issue after issue that Paul had to help people navigate through. But let me show you something interesting. In Galatians Paul writes and he says the following. It is good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I'm present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth are until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. You know, earlier this week I was with some beautiful young people in my church, a home visit uh, where the father had his little daughter, his baby daughter on his lap. He didn't even get up as I walked through the front door. He was staring into her eyes. He was so in love with his child. It's a very, very special relationship, that healthy relationship between a parent and a child. Honestly, even though Our children can be a handful, frustrating, irritating at times, selfish often, messy, downright naughty or just disobedient. Most parents would still take a bullet for their child. It would seem that Paul, to a degree at least, has positioned his own heart to see those in Galatia as his children. So he calls them in Galatians 4.19, my little children. Paul does the same thing again to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. And there we see the heart of Paul again. My beloved children. He chooses to see the saints in a very specific way. You know, I used to give my mom gray hair when I was young. My mom was super strict. Looking back now as a parent of three, I I suppose I didn't leave her much choice. I got so many hidings. Now, this was in a different era, in a different context. So please bear with me. I'll give you an example to keep you from nodding off. We lived in a big house with a big garden in a city called Pretoria in Southern Africa. Now, most gardens... Where I lived was big, certain, just because there was a lot of space. 
Anyway, at the back of our garden was a lemon tree planted by a fence that went around our swimming pool. This fence cut the back garden in half. One afternoon, I was replacing an inner tube of my push bike. As I ripped out the old inner tube filled with punctures, I noted its elasticity. And a fun thought started playing in the back of my mind. I ran into the house, I was home alone, I cut the inner tube in two. I ran back out again to the fence that separated the garden from the swimming pool, the back garden. And I took one half of the inner tube and started tying it around the fence post where the gate is. And the other against the other fence post. I stepped back to have a look at my brand new catapult. With the lemon tree planted by this fence, I had an ample supply of munition. Now our neighbors behind us had a corrugated roof on their house. With the lemon tree to my right, I got some ammunition. I plucked about 10 lemons and I wanted to see whether it was possible for me to fire these projectiles across the back of our swimming pool, across our six foot concrete back wall, across their back garden and onto their corrugated roof. So I took a lemon, I leaned back and I shot. It was the most beautiful thing as I watched the yellow trajectory sail through the air and smash against their back wall. It left a huge wet blotch where the impact was. Well, I took the second lemon and now I adjusted my trajectory, leaned further back, more of my weight, released, listened and clang. The most beautiful sound. Eight more lemons followed one after the other as I waged war. And after everything was shot, I ran around, around the back of the pool. I jumped the six foot wall, sat on the wall and beheld my theater of war. Broken pieces of lemon scattered the neighbor's garden. There were lemons on their corrugated roof and wet blotches against the back of their wall. Again, I thought, ran around the pool, got mun more munition, and for the next half an hour, just at the best time of my life. At some point in time, I sat on the back wall when somebody at the front of our garden honked their car horn. Now it was my responsibility, whenever that happened, to go to the front gate and open the gate so that people could drive in. I jumped off the back wall, I ran as fast as I could around the swimming pool and through the gate, where in a moment I suddenly saw my feet running into the air against the backdrop of blue skies. You see, I'd forgotten about the catapult stretched between the two fence posts. It caught me across the neck and flipped me. I fell so hard on the back of my neck and on my back that the wind escaped my lungs. When I was able to breathe again, I crawled into the house where some time later, my mother found me looking like somebody tried to strangle me. Purple and blue bruises across my neck that would stay for weeks. I got in so much trouble. About an hour and a half later, I was still licking my wounds when the front doorbell rang. You see, the neighbors who got home only to discover quite a substantial mess against the back of their house. Suffice it to say that I didn't see the light of day for weeks. You see, my mom was fierce. But then she was also my refuge. I was naughty. I was a busy kid. I gave her plenty of reason to get frustrated with me, but through it all, she loved me dearly. You know, recently I heard Andrew, the leader of our 412 Partnership of Churches, say that whenever he faces very difficult and tricky pastoral situations, especially ones where, where, where it looks like they, there's not going to be any reconciliation, he uses his imagination and puts the face of his daughter on that person. He leads his heart to see that person as part of his flesh, as one of his family, and deals with them in the exact same manner that he would deal with them if it was his daughter. You see, it seems to me that Paul did something similar. 
When it's your own, your approach in dealing with the frustration or the difficult situation or that seemingly difficult person is different. When it's your own child, yes, you get frustrated, yes, you get angry, and yes, you may be disappointed from time to time. Speak to any parent. But there is a foundation of love and a foundation of commitment and a foundation of devotion that can carry the load. So Paul says to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 6, Oh dear Corinthian friends, we have spoken honestly with you and our hearts are open to you. There is no lack of love on our part, but you have withheld your love from us. I am asking you to respond as if you were my own children. Open your hearts to us. You see, families fight. Families argue. Families disappoint from time to time. So it goes without saying that in God's family, this side of eternity, this side of heaven, we should expect friction and disappointment and mismatched expectations and frustrations, often actually. However, we do not respond like the world. Galatians 5 verse 22 to 25 reminds us, The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And so somebody in church frustrates you. They fail you. They, they hurt you. They ignore you. They take something that, that you perceive is yours. Or they say something that they had no right to say. And their knee-jerk reaction tends to be to allow for our emotions and to allow for our flesh to govern our response. But Paul says, no, don't do that. You see, the flesh will lead you to gossip and to slander. And to payback and to hostility and to quarreling and to keeping records and jealousy and discord and dissension. But, says Paul, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passion and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. In other words, when I feel like I want to react, when I feel like I want to be frustrating, frustrated, when I feel like I want to hold something against you, I have to take those feelings and crucify them against the cross and keep it nailed there. Even if you are acting terribly, even if I want to act terribly, I am going to choose to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will lead me to mercy and long-suffering and kindness and grace and undeserved love. And if I struggle to do so, what may help me in that moment is if I imagine that you are perhaps my son or my daughter, part of my family. A little bit it would seem like Paul did from time to time. And I could tell you, if, 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 if we fall out, if we have struggles with one another, yeah, it would be difficult. But if my daughter or my son did the same thing and caused me the same amount of pain, in the pain and in the hurt, will remain my unshakable desire to want to see you come through. Why? Well, it's my child. And what I'm really trying to get you to see and to provoke you to in this moment is not to have a bigger imagination or to use your imagination more actively, but rather to lead your heart. And to perceive that that person in front of you is of far greater value to Jesus or far greater importance to Him than the negative situation or circumstances would have you believe. You know, that person might be difficult. 
he or she may naturally rub you up the wrong way. He or she may naturally bring out the worst in you. However, the Bible says this in Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. And yes, it's easy for us perhaps sometimes to accept, yes, okay, Jesus, I accept. I am a masterpiece. Thank you. But so is that brother who you find so difficult in church or that sister who seems to always take from you, or that church member that never seems to agree with you or contribute. Ephesians 1 verse 4 would say, even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. And, and we would say, and our flesh would say, yes, Lord, I receive it. Before you made me, you loved me. Yes, you chose me. Here I am. Because of Jesus, I am without fault in your eyes. Praise God. Hallelujah. But you know what? So is that person you haven't spoken to in church for months. The one that you would rather avoid across the street so you don't have to speak to. The one who brings out regularly the worst in you. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 1, 7, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. You know, every day I pray for my children. God, save them. God, protect them from themselves. God, help them to make good decisions. God, may your ministering angels surround them. God, keep them from the deceitfulness of sin. Prepare for them godly spouses. May they have favor with you and favor with men. Lay the path ahead of them in fruitfulness and, and faithfulness. May they stay close to you. God, let their ears be close to your mouth. And on and on and on I would intercede for my children. I pray for them this way. Because they're part of me. They're part of my family. And let me tell you, more often than not, my kids drive me bonkers. But they're my kids. And so I choose to lead my heart. I choose to govern and temper my emotions. I choose to love them well. And my prayer is that perhaps Holy Spirit will stir us and remind us that in the mystery of all of this, in the reality of this walk we have with Christ Jesus, we are family one of another. It's not just something that we say. It's not just a pretty slogan. No, we have been adopted together into God's family. And we together have been tied by the same Holy Spirit inside of us. We are family. And in actual fact, we should be interceding for one another like this on a regular basis. And I want to conclude. You know, one of the values that we hold so dear within Living Hope, one of the values that we fight for as, as elders within this church, one of the values we want to hold up is that we truly want to love one another. Choose to love one another as Christ loved us. You know, when all is said and done, I want God's heart for you, not my own. I, I want to see you through His eyes, not my own. I, I want to love you the way that He loves you. And He loves you and He loves me not because we're special. We've done so much right in His eyes. No, He loves us as an act of His perfect will. In other words, He loves us because He chooses to do so. You and I, we are called to the privilege of doing the same. Perhaps as I've been speaking today, the Holy Spirit has come and, and brought to your remembrance a name or a face, a person. And I believe, as you heard my voice, uh, that's the Holy Spirit 
quietly whispering to you, there is reconciliation that needs to take place. There is a restoration that needs to be, or a relationship that needs to be invested in. There is somebody that I want you to love well and bless and pray over. Perhaps you realize in this moment that you've not always led your heart or allowed Holy Spirit to lead your heart. Perhaps today you realize that there are areas of your heart even that have grown cold towards other saints in the church and therefore towards parts of the body of Christ. I want to ask you to pray with me in the next few moments and invite the Holy Spirit to lead us to conviction and from conviction action for restoration. He can equip us and enable us to do what we simply can't do in our own strength. But what He requires from us is a choice and a decision. Will you pray with me? Will you choose to adopt the position of Paul the Apostle, who would refer to some of the most difficult saints that we've, that we've known or read about as my dear children? Can we see one another through the lens of love and family? Just where you are. Why don't you close your eyes and I'll pray for us. Father God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit knew about this message and those who would hear this message before the foundation of the world. And I pray even in the hearing of my voice right now that you will do a miracle, a miracle of restoration, a miracle of healing. I pray that, Lord, you will take the the cold parts and the hard parts of our hearts and our souls and by your love and through your mercy and by your grace will bring your healing anointing and soften our hearts towards those perhaps who frustrate us most. I pray that what would come out of our mouths would be blessings rather than curses, prayers of healing and affirmation, words of life rather than words from this world. I pray that, Lord, even today you will begin to effect great restoration in relationships that have suffered or even died in the last season of life. And I pray that you'll equip us and help us and enable us to love like Paul loved and even more so to love like Christ first loved us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Rousseau. What a powerful word and, and what a powerful service all round about um, how we love one another. And, you know, it's what's come through to me through the whole service is that love can sometimes in the world be seen as a soft concept or an easy concept or a throwaway idea but the reality is if we're going to love like Jesus there's a cost and and there's a cost both to ourselves and in how we live together and and just responding to Rousseau's word and the interview with the the young guys from South Africa it's so important to us to actually put this into practice so what is the one step we can do I wonder this week I'm thinking myself what's the one thing I can do to love more to love better and to look more like Jesus the way I love well bless you guys I pray that uh, today has spoken to you spoken into your hearts if you need prayer if you need support if we can help you in any way then just let us know get in touch drop us a line we'd love to hear from you or if the service has spoken to you we'd love to hear that as well you can drop a line to me personally or you can drop a line to the congregation now I mentioned during the service that I had some news about the online um, congregation the online service well I want to encourage us please can we switch to YouTube from now on so we'll give you some more information on Facebook but we're going to be um, focusing our online content on YouTube for the next foreseeable um, period so that's important I just want you to make a note of that and we'll let you know more and communicate more during the week but uh, just wanted to alert you to that and we'll see you in the week or see you next Sunday God bless
lovingers, you are so good, God. And your lovingers, yes, you are so good. And your lovingers today, you never change, always the same. You never change, always the same. You are so Never change, always the same. Yes, you are so good. You never change, always the same. You are so good. You never change, always the same. Yes, you are so good. You never change, always the same. Bro, what are we? What are we doing? No cap. No, no, no cap. I'm not doing cap. Bro, what are you gonna put your cap? Straight up. <laughs> Straight up. You have to. Are you guys not doing cap? I'm, I'm just doing cap. No, no, you gotta. What's the cap? cap? What are we doing after this? I'm capping here. I think we should start it with like tapping the mic. Is this on? And then we like, oh cool. Testing. Testing. <laughs>